It is another edition of Sunday Bloody Sunday here on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. I am Matt Berry. Week 12 of the college football season has wrapped up. Cheers to everyone who got a win. Cheers to everyone who didn't get a win. Cheers to everyone who just needs an extra Bloody Mary on a Sunday. As we do each and every week, we will sit here and recap some of the happenings across the country. A couple of big games that I want to get to last night because we have an opportunity to look now of what's coming the rest of the way. And that stops and starts in the Pac-12 with what happened uh, last night with Washington going to Corvallis and getting a very impressive win that came down to the very end. And when you look at what Washington has done, they all they've done is answer every test. And to me, as we go down the stretch, people try to pick and choose, should this happen? Should this team be ranked? Washington just keeps winning. I mean, they went to Oregon State their last three weeks of the season. I get it. It doesn't look as good now, but USC was ranked at the time. They win that one 52-42 against Utah, ranked at the time 35-28, and then last night on the road 22-20. to And I think of all the ranked teams, perhaps Washington's kind of the one that's getting a little bit of disrespect. Florida State for now is ranked ahead of them. We'll get to Florida State's uh, issues in a minute. But I still continue to be in, in, be impressed with Washington and everything Michael Penix had done this season. Every time backs are against the wall, they find a way to win. Now, I've been told the committee still can't get it out of their heads. The Arizona State 15-7 to and the Stanford kind of end of game where they pulled away 42-33. I get it. The Arizona State thing was not a good look for Washington. But every single team this year has had one of those games. Every single team. Now, Florida State's got bigger issues now because the Jordan Travis injury is one of the most horrific we've seen in quite some time, especially for a college football playoff contender. But they had their close one against Boston College and Chestnut Hill barely got out of that. And Boston College is now six and five on the season. Clemson, I get it. Clemson's winning games now. They're seven and four now, but they had to go to Clemson. That game was close. And all of this is to say that every year, a college football team, unless you're just one of the more dominant in the country, has a game or two where they just don't look great. But you can't sit here and tell me that Washington, as of now, shouldn't be ranked in the top four. And I don't want to put Florida State out of it because of, of the injury. I think you seriously have to consider where they are now. Jordan Travis is the face of that team and program. They're still loaded. But with Tate Rodemaker at quarterback, are they the same? The answer is no. How is that going to manifest itself? The answer is we don't know. They've got Florida Thanksgiving weekend, and then they've got the ACC championship against Louisville. By the way, cheers to Louisville. First ever appearance in an ACC championship game. Year one of Jeff Brom, by the way. Did anyone see that coming in year one? Here's how this went with Louisville. And it's really a remarkable story. Louisville, let's put it this way. They were in like with Scott Satterfield. They weren't in love with Scott Satterfield. You know, they'd, they'd take him out to dinner. They'd hang out, Netflix and chill every once in a while. But they wouldn't put a ring on it. they just kind of like, well, he's our coach. Are we going to buy him out? We flirted with Brom this last time around. He wanted to stay at Purdue. And then out of nowhere, Fickle goes to Wisconsin, which, by the way, nice win for Wisconsin last night at home against Nebraska. And Cincinnati – hires Satterfield away from Louisville, which means Louisville didn't have to fire him, pay a buyout, and then they get the hometown hero to finally come home and coach his alma mater. And now they're in the HCC championship game. Of all the silly stuff we see in coaching, Louisville's laughing that Satterfield left free of charge. Brom comes home. And now they're playing in the ACC championship game. I know that was a little bit of a tangent. That was on my way of saying Florida State gets Louisville and a great story in the champ game. And we're going to know. Now, if Rodemaker comes out there and Florida State still dominates, throws it all over the field to, to Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson, throw them in the playoff. But as of right now, I would still probably have them in the top four. I'd have Michigan out. They needed everything they could get to beat Maryland on Saturday. Maryland's okay. They're not great. But Michigan hadn't played anybody. They've played Penn State. 
before these Michigan fans come at me, well, who have they played different than Ohio State? The Notre Dame game still means something to Ohio State's resume. Michigan doesn't have that. They just don't. You can't sit there and look at this objectively and say, oh, same schedule. It's not. Now, it'll play itself out. But if I was ranking them right now, based on what I saw over the weekend, I think Georgia is by far and away the most dominant number one team in the country. That's settled. I think Ohio State, because of the resume with the win over Notre Dame and how they've handled teams, they're number two right now. I think number three, I would put Washington because of what Washington did again, three straight ranked teams in a row. They've got the Apple Cup coming up this weekend. I'd put Washington three. I would put Florida State four. And then with an opportunity to play themselves into it or out of it, based on what we saw, I would put Michigan five and I'd put Oregon State six. I'm sorry, Oregon six, dollar for calling Oregon, Oregon State. I put Oregon six sitting there waiting for a rematch. They've got the Civil War with Oregon State coming up, which is always a tough game, but that'll play itself out as well. And so there's still so much football left to be played. But Saturday was really an indicator of what we're in store for the final week of the season. Because there was two road tests that I was looking at going, huh, what's going to happen here? No Jonathan Brooks for Texas. Ames, Iowa, tough place to play. First half, a little sleepy. I believe it was 3-3 or 6-3. Second half, Quinn Ewers started to assert himself. Texas comes away with a very, very, very big win on the road against Iowa State. I mentioned Washington going on the road. Those were the two games we ID'd as potentially a breaking point in the college football season didn't happen. And so now we gear up for the Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving Texas has Texas Tech. McGuire and Texas Tech can be pesky. That's not going to be a layup. In Washington, they have the Apple Cup. Oregon has the Civil War. Alabama has the Iron Bowl. All of these games are going to matter going into the final week. And I'll say this. We were talking about it last night. When you look at the four-team playoff structure, we know what we have until the end of this year. When you look at the top, 12 how important some of these games would be next year 12th right now in the rankings college football playoff rankings penn state just behind them ole miss and oklahoma can you imagine how important those games would be for ole miss let's say the egg bowl next week for ole miss sitting at 13 trying to get into the top 12 penn state sitting there at 12 can they hang on Oregon State's 11th. They would drop out with a loss in the Civil War, which would help Ole Miss get in. Louisville at 10. Would they still be in the top 12, even with a loss in the ACC Championship? They have Kentucky in their annual rivalry game. Missouri would be in right now. Alabama might be in the 14 playoff, but they would be in right now. I mean, when you look where we are headed in the sport from 4 to 12, the final week of the regular season next year, If it mirrors anything we've seen this year, fascinating stuff. And I'm all for the 12 team playoff uh, next year. A couple of news and notes I want to get to here on Sunday, bloody Sunday, Dino Babers after eight years out uh, at Syracuse. That's a tough job. Uh, He was on top of the world as Paul Feinbaum and I discussed on our recap when they beat Clemson. There was that famous video of him. Dan- that was the worst dance, by the way. Uh, famous video of him dancing in the locker room after beating Clemson. You're thinking Dino Babers is going to get this done. He was fired after eight years. There are some reports also out there by 247 Sports, 247 Sports, that Sam Pittman could be safe at Arkansas. That was a job that many of us ID'd as perhaps one that could come open because of Arkansas' struggle this year. At least for now, that appears to be um he appears to be safe obviously that could change but those are the reports out on Sunday morning and other coaching news what is going to be made of the Jimbo Fisher departure at Texas A&M that story has blown up it is settled now the interview process happens Jeff Trailer had reportedly interviewed for it uh, last week head coach UTSA he continues to be dominant in that conference they will have an opportunity in the American to play for the American championship first year in that league. And they have Tulane, which is going to be one of the great undercard games of the weekend coming up next week. So trailer's name has been thrown out there. They went big game hunting with Dan Campbell. He's like, thanks, but no thanks. I'm in the NFL. I'm good. Dan Lanning's come out and said, no, 
publicly. Deion Sanders has come out and said no publicly. Dabo Sweeney. All the denials are starting to happen. But Texas A&M still very much in a, in a, uh, a hiring mode, waiting for some of these schools to finish up their season while hiring um, or while interviewing during the season. A&M gets the win yesterday, 38-10. Uh, kind of a whatever against Abilene Christian. And they've got LSU uh, in the final game, which I believe, and I'm going to sit here, I'm going to stump for him again, because I believe that we have to stop with the Heisman Trophy going to the best player on the best team. We've seen it happen in the past. Uh, Robert Griffin the third, even Tim Tebow the year he won it. Uh, there was one other Heisman Trophy winner uh, that I can't recall at the time. Oh, Lamar Jackson. There's three Heisman Trophy winners that weren't on the best team in college football the year that they won it. That's where we are with Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels is the most outstanding player in college football, and I don't think it's close. Now, if Jaden next week against Texas A&M throws three picks and doesn't do anything, you might have an argument for some voters that are out there. Four losses probably wouldn't be the best look. But as we sit here today, give the Heisman Trophy to Jaden Daniels. He has been insane over the past few weeks. Eight touchdowns accounted for last night against Georgia State. That ties a record by Joe Burrow, who you guessed it, and won a national championship that year. And so the storylines down the stretch here as we wrap it up on Sunday, Bloody Sunday. What's going to happen with Florida State with their quarterback situation? Can they maintain it going through Florida in the ACC championship? What team out there needs to survive Thanksgiving weekend to either A, play for their conference championship game, and B, keep their playoff hopes alive? And what coach in the final week of the season is going to be coaching on the hot seat going into next year? Because if I'm Lincoln Riley in USC, I think Bill Plasky wrote about it this morning in the LA Times, honeymoon's over, hot seat's on. And that to me is the most surprising story in college football. You couldn't have, you couldn't have had me take a bet that said USC was going to lose five games. Probably should have been six on the road against Cal. One of the most disappointing stories in the last few years of a college football season with the expectations that USC had with Caleb Williams coming back with the Trojans hitting the portal as hard as anyone stunned at how that season ended. And by the way, USC is in the clubhouse. They played week zero. They've played their 12 games. They're seven and five. They'll go to a bowl game. I'd be shocked if Caleb Williams plays and doesn't opt out. But I'm a USC fan this morning. I'm waking up and I'm like, was that a nightmare? Did that happen? What the hell happened to this team that was a play? I thought I had him in the playoff. I had USC in the playoff because I thought they were so loaded. But that's why we love the sport. The most unpredictable thing. If you think it's not going to happen, just give it time. It will. I hope everyone's enjoyed this edition of Sunday Bloody Sunday. I uh, hope everyone has a healthy and happy Thanksgiving and a start to the holidays. But here's what we know. As you're getting fat and sassy on your turkey and your tryptophan and your, and your desserts and everything you're going to eat, just remember, save some room for college football Friday and Saturday because mark it down. I say it each and every week. Chaos is coming. And what better way to wrap up the regular season? on a Sunday Bloody Sunday here on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. Give me something I can feel. Light a cigarette just so I can breathe.